still very, very good seeing you again. Um, I have yeah. my list of questions here, so I'm I'm going to pull. Uh, sure. Pull How have you up. been, by the way? Everything good? Yeah, yeah, going real well. And, Wonderful. Uh, the business is doing well. Our business is plural. No, it's just keeping it's keeping us busy. Yeah. Really. So, good. It's a good thing. <laughs> very good. I'm glad to hear that. I hadn't so, seen you in a few years. Yeah, so we're Chris and I were just talking yesterday. It's uh summer NAM twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. it's, hard, it's hard to believe it was that long ago. Wow. Absolutely amazing. So you're in Nashville now, right? Yes, I'm back in Nashville. How are you liking it? Or how liking do you like it? Yeah, liking it a lot. I really love Nashville. It's uh, just cool. a pity we're in a situation where there's not much we can do. I know, I know. Yeah, good old Edley's. <laughs> Edley's barbecue. You gotta love it. Oh, yeah. When whenever whenever we go down there, that's like one of the first places that we go over to Edley's. That's great. Good Do you stuff. think that uh you think some of them will be on next year? I hope so. You know they canceled Winter Nam already. So I've just it, it, it's so frustrating. I mean, we have friends. Uh, I have a real close friend that's in the uh, the live sound business, and he's just out of work. I mean, he's got a little, you know, one here and one there, but it's it's not enough to sustain. It's crazy. It's put so many people out of work already. I don't yeah, know. this is, these are extraordinary times for sure. We never saw it coming. <laughs> no, 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 and I don't ever want to see it again, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, that's darn sure. So, um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to go down the, the the list of questions here. Okay. Um, and uh, so, uh, so what artists have you been working with in Nashville? Well, that's actually a good question because uh, I primarily built my own music because uh, my training, my background is in synthesis and composition and uh, live performance techniques. So when I construct a project, I come up with the ideas myself. I sit down and it could be a new sound that I've developed, or maybe I have to complete something in time for a project. And the project is usually live performance. Okay. So um, I, I'm, as they say, the hunter and gatherer of all my ideas. <laughs> Cool. Way cool. Uh, so uh, people that I've involved, uh, who have been involved in my work, tend to be when I want that magical touch or that's a personality that I feel that they could bring to the piece. Uh, for example, my third album, uh, Crossing Paths, had the uh, uh, fantastic Dean Parks. I can't think of any other way to describe him, but he's a guitar player and he's played sessions for so many people. And the he didn't even bring his magic box. He was the magic. <laughs> you know, wow. he was the magic himself. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, so, uh, so in a situation like that, you know, he brought the ingredient which wasn't just a sound or a line it was his personality yep. Yep. uh same thing with live performance because i write with an idea in mind uh, and i love writing because that's my training but i love performing because that's my training too i was a classically trained pianist uh, at the elder conservatorium <laughs> most of us i think that's our foundation and that's a good foundation to have it's a it strong is. foundation, yeah. Everything should be built on it. Um, so, uh, so when I write for live performance, which is a very different animal from an album, or you know, uh, uh, recording for an album rather than writing for a, a live show, it's quite different. Especially when you look at the live show as an entire production not just song at a time but an entire production right right uh so that's when i bring people with personalities in as well um they need to have that magical touch and i've had i really enjoy those because they come up with the 
the bricks and mortar that you don't think of because they're not you. Right. Right. And and I struggle with that same thing as well. I want to, you know, when I'm in the studio, as I have been, uh, well, this past week, and I spent a good amount of time down here, but um, it, it, I know what you mean. The live performance, there's something that's unique when you go on stage with other people and, and you interact and you have that, that incredible, you either have an incredible interaction or a terrible one. <laughs> and I've had both in my career. But uh, it's it's really nice when when you have a good re interaction with people and and uh, and they just feel it, you know, and and then the groove, you know, I call it the groove. The groove just starts and and you're there. Uh, it's it's wonderful. Yeah, I think the 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 show gets when it t gets to the next level when it transcends just performing a piece, then it becomes beyond magical, you That's know. Right as you were saying, when the groove happens and the vibe happens yeah. and it starts to float away, it's on yeah. a different level to it's just playing. playing the piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just playing now, it's this whole different experience. Yeah, and, and it's it's magical for both, in my opinion, both the, the performers and the audience, because the audience is gonna see something that may never be replicated again and and the performer is just like you know you you're, you literally are elevated to uh, to another plateau. So, which yeah, is why I, I love I li yeah, which is why I love live performance. And it's really sad that what's happening now is impacting the live scene. It will never be the same again, yeah. even if we all try to make it the same again. It will never be. You know, the, we've experienced this. We have some fears that hold us back and some, you know, venues have been hot hit by the whole situation and touring companies and so on and so forth. Everyone's been hit in some way or other. So I don't think piecing it together is going to be quite the same again. It will never be the same tapestry. No, no. I, no we, we can only hope that it comes back bigger and stronger in just a slightly different way and uh that would be that would be beyond my hope and expectations but uh i'm not holding my breath <laughs> but I, it is what it is i mean at this point you know it's onward and upward right you just have to keep keep plugging away and going at it so i get it i get it so i i have to ask about the theremin first um mm -hmm. when when you record, and, and then I'm going to ask you also about live, but let, let's start with studio. Uh, when you're recording the theremin, um, it, is that, are you miking that or are you plugging in direct? Um, how, how, how are you recording that? That's a very good question, Jim, because most people don't think about it. They just assume they know what's going to happen. But assumptions, you know, the theremin in itself is not a regular assumption, so you can't have regular assumptions about the theremin. <laughs> well, uh, the theremin does not generate sound within itself. It's not an acoustic instrument, and it hasn't got built-in speakers either. It needs to be plugged into something for you to hear it, uh, which makes it, that's why it's so hard to play it well because you can point your fingers in the air but if you don't hear it loud enough or hear it at all you're just pointing your fingers in the air there's no audio feedback to give you a clue as to whether you're in tune or not yeah. or I what note you're playing so yeah. it's like doing this what note am i playing i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so well, that one is usually uh in the studio, I tend to just take the line out, so to speak, and put it in my interface. Direct, okay. Yes, direct. Um, I've not met anyone who has suggested that it be mic'd. Um, and I wouldn't imagine, I mean, unless you had like your favorite amplifier in the world, you know, like a guitar player, you know, I've, I've got this wall of, of amplifier tube amps over there. Yeah. But I would assume that that's probably a bit different and going, so when you're playing live, I'm assuming you're going direct in the board as well. Yeah, if I'm playing, and but I do request for, you know, uh, a speaker place on a stand that's close to me. But most occasions I haven't had that benefit. Most venues don't 
cater to theremin is so they don't have an extra speaker, pound speaker on a stand that they can raise for you. So I would have to put it on the ground like uh, like you would with a monitor wedge or sit it on a stool or something like that. Because uh, particularly when you play live, actually that's not quite true because I had a studio experience where I had an orchestra play with me and I had um, semi-open headphones that let the orchestra sound bleed in without me realizing that it would and I had to record. Anyway, before I tell you that anecdote, so... Yeah. So live, because there's so much going on, right? If, you know, you're not playing on your own, you're playing with other people. <laughs> right, right. So uh, if you if you don't have a, an, an ability to hear what you're playing, it's very difficult to play. But you can't say, stop, stop, I can't hear myself. The show has started already and it's got to continue. For a while uh, there, I used in-ear monitors, but uh, back then in-ear monitors didn't have this ability to feed some ambient sounds in it. Now you do have in-ear monitors that allow you to tweak a little ambient sound in your in-ear so you don't feel so isolated That's as you would yeah. with the closed headphones. Um, but I've endeavored to try and play with a speaker, you know, so I can hear and feel everything that's going on. So as we were talking about earlier on the vibe thing, um, now the studio situation, but uh, but it's still very hard to play live if you're playing with a rock band, and that's what I tend to do. Or I write material that's more like fusion, fusion and prop rock based. Uh, so it's you know it's a lot happening. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, uh, I love yeah. I love prog. So that's so good yeah. stuff. So when there's a lot happening and the audio frequency spectrum of the theremin is so wide that inevitably there will be, uh, your ears will start filtering out certain frequencies because there's so much going on. And again, your ability to play in tune depends on what you can hear. So when your ear starts to artificially filter out because some other instrument is, is occupying that frequency band, then you start to miss out on things, you know, because of the harmonics, the overtones, yeah. colors, the sound of the theremin in its frequency range. So when the overtones start to be, uh, what's the word, obscured by other instruments, you start having trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's never fun. I had a similar situation and with this recording with the orchestra in Nashville, it was a studio session. And uh, I didn't realize that I, you know, I should have brought my own headphones or I should have asked for an alternative arrangement. But it was a beautiful, you know, National Symphony Orchestra. I don't think it was the entire orchestra, but they took up the whole uh, chapel part of the uh, Ocean Way studio. And I could have just sat there and listened to them, but I had to play, you know. But they, <laughs> they call it actually into what I was monitoring and I struggle but so when you struggle you have to dig into your your experience self the person who's been practicing for a long time you gotta dig into that self you know and uh, hope that wherever your hand is is the right pitch <laughs> mm. oh that's that that can always be fun um, so I, I'm gonna I'm going to ask another question about the, the theremin and uh, and sort of this. I kind of had this all lumped together as one, but um, what do, do you tend to use an EQ uh, or compression or anything on the theremin when you record? That's a very good question. Uh, there have been times I've had to put compression. I don't EQ as I record. I try to record without any effects or plugins or any uh, outboard. You know, I tend to record straight into my door. Uh, so in this day and age, you don't really need a lot of outboard gear to, to oh. make that happen. You just need to execute a plugin or two or three. But I try not to do that. I, I like to have it as is in its original form and shape. Okay. Um, but it does have, well, at least the Etherwave, the Mo Music Etherwave, the one that you see me use, the black box. I yep. have two theremins. I have another one called the Eth e Pro e Etherwave Professional. 
and that is uh, Bob uh, described it as a digital analog experiment, whereas the ETH wave is purely analog, and it has a very uninhibited volume uh. am amplitude. So uh, I went uh, several times when I done live shows, the engineers would shout at me and say, can you turn the volume down? Because when I go into the higher registers, it just shrieks. But there's yeah. no volume control per se on the theremin. There's oh, wow. no, you know, where you turn down the dB. You just can't that that, yeah, you can't do that on this theremin. Um, and by virtue of the fact that it's analog and, and it shrieks in the high registers is the characteristic of this theremin, you know. It's like asking a soprano singer, when you go up in the high registers, can you not sing so loud? Uh, they can somewhat, but the physics kind of... You're backing off the microphone, right? Yeah, and the physics yeah. restrains them in a way they have to sing somewhat loudly. Um, so yeah, uh, but I usually put a compressor on after. Okay. EQ, I try not to, but uh, EQ only comes in when I'm mixing. Yeah, and that's that's okay. I, I'm looking for not necessarily just while you're recording, but even during the mix down process. So, so you do yeah. use some EQ on occasion, and you use compression uh, just to uh, kind of level, level the instrument out a little bit. Uh, in terms of mix down, I always use an EQ, okay. but I'm not very. I, I'm not heavy handed. It's a uh, just a little light nudge. Because I already yeah. have in my head all the sound sources that I want in my soundscape. But, you know, just to tidy it up a bit to make yeah. it cleaner, you know what I'm saying, and more with more clarity. So when you hear it, you don't have to struggle so much. Gotcha. You know, you, yeah, I do. I always use EQs. It's part of my routine when I mix down. Uh, I use a lot of EQing. And again, just very light nudge. I'm not heavy handed with anything at all. I don't want to destroy the sound. Right, right. So so then that brings me into, of course, the classic reverb delay. Do you put any reverb or delay on it? So if we're still talking about theremin, because I also sing and I play tin whistle and I play synths as well, but you know, with the synthesizer, I do construct or synthesize the sounds I want to use and I tend to attach effects to it as I build the sound, you know, because I hear what I want, where I want it to appear. And I usually hear not just the sound, but how the sound lives and dies. So I would tend to already factor in whether I want to delay or any other effect. It could be, you know, any of our standard uh, guitar pedals, it could be a so as I was saying, it could be a delay, it could be a flange, it could be bass distortion, it could be fuzz, you know, all the standard guitar pedals that we're used to, I, I would hear it in my head, I'd lay it out and decide what I want to use. Of cool. course, with uh, our modern doors, there's so many different plugins that are available for so many things, so it's right. important to play with it. Uh, so with the theremin, I have used uh, so-called guitar effects uh, to alter the voice uh, in my construction of a piece. Okay. Usually, now I put it in, you know, I construct what I want it to sound like in my music instead of just plug in a delay after, if you know what I'm saying. Just yeah. like if you were a guitar player and you decide, oh, I want some distortion here with a delay, you put it in as you you know, before you play, not after. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, right. so that's the sequence of events for me. Um, yeah, I can't. I think that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm going to move on now to acoustic piano. Um, do you ever record that? And, yes. And how do you record that? So what's your miking techniques for? Okay. Uh, I always go with convention, the way I was taught. And the first thing I apply is my ear. So you walk around the instrument. I'm, I know you already know this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Our, so our I, audience probably does not. And I think that's a very good 
it's it's a good base for them to understand you know where you're coming from and then the industry so i think what's important is to understand that your ear is your most important tool uh, i'm sorry for those who are hearing uh, disadvantaged uh, but I share my woes with you because I also have a hearing problem so but you know with whatever you have you can always use that and uh, then do comparisons so I walk around the instrument and I know there's uh, the harp of the piano so to speak uh, and I record grand pianos not the upright so I'm going to yeah. refer to the grand yeah, yeah. And so, I, so yeah. All right, Good. so the half of the piano uh, is where your sound emanates and the tones come out, the, the different tones of the piano. So I tend to use two kind of like a pen, I uh, use pencil mics, mm -hmm. two pencil mics, uh, pro, uh, I believe they're dynamic mics. Yeah. And I put one on the treble and one on the bass and then I move them around. Until you're so, satisfied. Yeah, so I only use two. So I have tried using a third one on the keyboard itself because I wanted the sound of the clicking and clacking. Okay. It depends on you. You need to, I think for the person who wants to sample an instrument or record an instrument, you need to decide what kind of animal it is. Yeah, yeah. So for example since i use the word animal a dog is not a dog a dog may be a dog to you but to someone else it's a family member yeah. so with that in mind you treat them you might treat them differently gotcha so yeah. uh, so the way i decide uh when i record a acoustic piano is what do i want out of this recording what will come in useful and it's okay to take more than less because with more you can always say well i don't need that clacking yeah, yeah. let's mute that one i think i'm happy with just the two pencil mics so it, that's a very important thing and and it's something that i talk about very frequently in my in my videos that i do and you know it, when you're recording it's about the song it's not about the single instruments about the the entire song when it's done because it's never you know the perfect sound of that instrument all by its lonesome you know and i think a lot of uh, especially guitar players really get you know just oh you know this tone this tone this tone and you know and being a guitar player myself as well you know i understand that but when you sit down and you you start to play engineer slash producer um it really i'm staring at my my studio so that's why i'm kind of looking over there i'm like yeah and I, it literally, I think people just lose that fact that, hey, this this is, you know, yes, it's a living, breathing entity, but the song is a far larger living, breathing entity. And that's what the people are going to hear. Your audience is going to hear. And, uh, you know, it may sound perfect this way, but you have to adjust it a little bit because it's got to fit in the mix. And that uh, you had mentioned also before when you're talking about the theremin and, you know, having the overtones and, and uh, you know, you get some, the symbiotic res resonance in certain frequencies. And you've got to carve that out of the recordings. It's, you know, it over exaggerates those frequencies and it can make it sound boomy or, you know, whatever, shrill. And and, uh, and that, it's I think a lot of people that are recording uh either don't understand it or, or don't get it in some way and and uh, so that thank you for bringing that up because that's that's very important and and i know i i want our audience to to understand that it's about the song you know at the end of the day it's about the piece that you're recording not about the single instrument and and that not that it's not important it's very important but it's a piece of the soup you know <laughs> you're making soup you've got to add all the ingredients and make it right so uh, yeah, that that's that's way cool. And so the the what is your favorite synth and you know slash keyboard? So uh, that's a, also another very good question. I guess they're all good questions because I think very deeply about why I do things and therefore why I buy certain things. <laughs> yep. Well, I, I started off um, strangely enough learning electronic music from Tristram Carey. He was one of the key figures of uh, London's electronic music studios. And um, of course, he didn't, you know, get so involved with the synthesizer as we know it now. But 
in terms of exploration, he was very keen on discovery. So I think I kind of picked that up and it became something that I do quite often when I look at things and, and I need to make decisions on things. I always start with the discovery phase, you know, learn more about something, what it is that appeals to you. Do you want to use it? How do you want to use it? Um, so when it came to synthesizers, I really had no preference. <laughs> I just wanted them all. It's possible. Minor details, right? Yeah, all because uh, you know, with with the modern door, we can we get access to every type of synthesis method, but not that long ago, uh, you couldn't. So you would have probably a room full of synths of every kind, ones with keyboards, ones without keyboards. Uh, so, and you know, they might come from the East Coast, the West Coast, they might come from across the Atlantic, they could come from anywhere in the world, but you want them all. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, however, I did settle on my workhorse eventually, and it was the Kurzweil. Uh, uh, the Kurzweil had a lot of power under the hood, yeah. so to speak, if you treated it like a v motor vehicle. You know, it had a lot in its engine, but you have to dig into it and, and figure what all the bits do. Uh, but as a live performance keyboard as well, it gave you so much power. There's so much you could do in terms of assigning, uh, not just, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna use this as an example because most people know what arpeggiators are. So, you know, you could use that and a whole lot of other things as well that it gave you. Uh, it could even give you micro tuning if you dare to explore. And this was quite a few years ago, you know, it had a lot under its hood. Um, shortly after that, I had to choose to use a MIDI controller okay. for various reasons. And the primarily, uh, the primary reason was that I want to scale down and go light. I think it was about the same time that, uh, Airlines start charging us for check-in luggage and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> oh yeah, <laughs> the expense, the lovely airlines. Thank you, uh, American and and uh, United. <laughs> yeah, I think American was the first one to uh, advocate for check uh, for to pay for check-in luggage. If I'm not wrong, I think, and I remember, I believe it was before I moved to Nashville. To 2008 or 2009, thereabouts, when it took place. Can't believe it's been more than 10 years since we've been paying for our check in luggage. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you don't even think about it anymore. It's just, they have you us, they have, us, they have us beat uh, down. So, MIDI controllers also allowed me to forget about, you know, being chained to one synthesizer because it could open the windows and the doors to all the synth techniques that my dog gave me. And of course I use Logic Pro, uh, but Logic Pro is attached to Apple. So um, I know that you probably don't have it. I have been a Cubase user as well. Prior to Logic, I used Cubase. In fact, uh, I did do, if I'm not wrong, at least two clinics for them in Singapore. Uh, prior to that, I was an opcode VS, a Vision DSP user as well. Of course, they are no more. They were bought by Gibson, I think, That's quite terrible. a while ago. Uh, but I've been a Logic Pro user since 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, so, uh, and of course, Logic Pro is quite powerful as well. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Uh, you have to dig really deep, you know, but you can use it just on the surface, so to speak, you know, superficially, everything is there that you need. But if right. you want to dig deeper, you could spend a lot of long, lonely nights dig, uh, digging deeper as well. Um, so, so yeah, I now have been for many years now using MIDI controllers. Uh, I bought the Axiom, uh, M Audio Axiom 49. Okay. Yeah. When I first went MIDI controller route, um, and I like the key action, 
Uh, the key action is quite important to me because I'm a piano player as well as a synth player. Yeah. I'm a tra trained synth player, so I want a bit of to be able to do a bit of both. Uh, and the key action therefore is important for me. And uh, it's got the wheels. Um, when I'm in Singapore, I don't have you know because I tend to take shorter trips in Singapore, so I don't carry MIDI control with me. I have had a Corp Triton on loan. And wow. the Triton is not a MIDI controller, but it's a MIDIable keyboard. Right, so I right. just need to have the right cables. And it comes with a joystick. Ah. Yeah, so that's I have the... to adapt, yeah. Yeah. Now that's that's good. So so obviously you're using a lot of virtual instruments, so VSTIs. Uh, and by the way, I'm a Nuendo guy. So uh, Cubase Nuendo, that's, I've been using it since version one. Shows, yeah, shows. It, they're Time. good. I, I did really like Cubase when I used it. I think I used Cubase on my second, first and second album, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's a, it's a great DAW. I, I think there there's a ton of good ones out there. Uh, the new Studio One Pro uh, 5 is amazing. Um, I've got endorsees that are using that. Some are using Cubase. It's just all over the place. So but it's good. But let's talk about VSTIs because I, I know I have some of my favorites uh, like Omnisphere, Spectrosonics Omnisphere and Keyscape and Trillion. And I, I just, I don't know, that, that's my number one go-to when I sit down at, at night. I have a Roland MIDI controller here and then I have, uh, I don't even know what I bought of it. I think I have an Icon. Um, as well, 88 key. Uh, again, the piano player on me needs the 88. You know, gotta have all those octaves to deal with. But um, so, what are, what are what's your go-to's? You know, your, your favorites. Well, the I go to my go-to is Logic Pro's vast uh, soft synths. Uh, they call them audio unit uh, soft synths. They have everything. Uh, anything under the sun, uh, physical modeling, FM synthesis, uh, analog, uh, sorry, uh, an uh, modular synthesis methods, uh, the whole thing, and uh, the latest update 10.6 has included uh, another department. Uh, they built another department <laughs> to Logic Pro, so you can do a lot of beat pattern type work. And uh, so, you know, so the work environment is like a grid window and there's cells involved and you can build audio MIDI or pattern cells in each each cell. And you can start building it up into uh, a sequence of, of events, much like you would do with Ableton Live kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, so... I have been, I know, very lazy with adding other VSTs to what Logic Pro has already, but yeah, I'm guilty of not. I did buy and download Contact, but I haven't actually used it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's, yeah, and I, Dave Instruments definitely has it going on. I, yeah, Contact I'm looking forward to, yeah, spending some time with that. Uh, but there's so much still in Logic Pro that I'm trying to go through, you know, it's like, Swimming in the ocean, it's never ending. Oh, tell me about it. I, and, and I am very guilty myself of buying a million of them. And then, you know, you, oh, yeah, I want to use this one. And then you barely scratch the surface and then you're on to the next one. And uh, yeah, I'm terrible to do that. exactly. And um, I'm, my guilty pleasure is spending a lot of time on one thing and seeing how much I can get out of the one thing. Uh, how Smart. much meaning building my own sounds. Yeah. And I kind of pride myself on being able to build my own sounds and not buying so much. It's just me. It's just my preference because that's what I teach, you know, how to how to get as much out of what you have because it allows my students to practice uh, the concepts and the methodology and all that rather than, oh, well, I want an FM sound. I'll just buy something that gives me the sounds. I don't have to create it. <laughs> And, and that's, again, that's my my problem is I don't take that time to do that. And consequently, I don't know that portion as well as I should. You know, for all the bloody years I've been doing it, you would think that I would. But, uh, you know, it th there's so much out there and uh, and it can be overwhelming. And a, a lot of our customers and, and, you know, and past students that I've had as well, same thing. You know, you, you, 
you start going down one rabbit hole and all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, have you tried this? And and then you hear it, and you're like, oh, that's cool. And then you're off down to that rabbit hole and you can get caught up in that. And uh, and I, again, I'm extremely guilty of, of doing that very thing that I preach you shouldn't. <laughs> so don't yell at me, students, please. <laughs> Do not. So, all right, well, that that's good to know. I mean, because I think that's very important to a takeaway for all the Slick Audio uh, customers and fans is, is you know, just knowing that, that you're taking, you know, one VSTi and you're just tearing it apart, you know, and, and can create everything and, and know it that well, which is extremely admirable. So uh, hats off to you for that. That's, Thanks. I do know I do know several professional keyboard or synth players who rather just use the sound library. So you know you don't have to be one or the other. You can right. make it this. Yeah, you can be one this today and that tomorrow. It's okay. It's a okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, let's let's shift over to vocals since that's the last thing that we didn't talk about yet. Um, it's not so when you record your vocals uh what microphone what's your your go-to mic that's a good question again if you bear in mind the way i uh, i start with exploration and sometimes and i know i'm a rebel at the best of times if someone says a i'm gonna say b <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. It it doesn't always bode me bode well for me when I do that when I'm a rebel. <laughs> That's right. We forgive you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So therefore, um, when I first moved to Nashville, I met up with the folks at Mike Tech. Okay. I don't know if you know them. I do. And uh, they had released the C5. I think that was it. The C5 condenser mic for vocals and they told me that I was looking for a vocal mic for studio purposes because they kind of modified it for me for live performance as well so I have a, a live performance mic version of it nice um and for a long time I played devil's advocate in the notion that if you know how to place your mic doesn't matter what microphone you use, it will be fine. But then I know that certain microphones bring up characteristics, especially if it's a voice, yeah, in your voice that you won't hear in the other microphones, especially when it's voice. If you're talking, you know, because maybe I should put it this way, the voice tells the story of the person it, their personality and the story they want to tell. I know you, if you're an instrumentalist, you're probably saying, but what about guitar? You know, but yeah, I get it, but it's not a person's voice. There's something about person's voice that people kind of attach themselves to and they want something out of it. They want to extract something out of it. Personally, they yeah. want to extract it at a personal level, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, you've you've got to feel those nuances and characteristics yeah. for you. Yeah. It, it, I know I've got a pile of mics here, and some I sound absolutely horrible on. Not that I sound great to begin with, but you know, <laughs> Chris is kind of looking at me, smiling. You know, but yeah, I get it. It it's you find those one or two that just suits your you know your, yeah. your timber and the tonality and and texture of your voice. Yeah, so, and so the the Mic Tech C5 has done that for me, so that's awesome. that's my go-to. Yeah. Cool. That that is good to know. That is good to know. The so slick audio, folks. There you go. Mic Tech C5. Um. All right. So what what monitors are you using in your studio? Actually, hold on, Jim. I only verify that C5 and not C7. I think it's C7, sorry. They make two, C5 and C7. I think it was a C7. Yeah, C7. C7, okay. Beg your pardon, my apologies. No, no worries, no worries. We're human. <laughs> All right, good. It was the PM5 that was a live performance mic. Ah, uh, okay. It was the C7 was a studio mic. Gotcha. 
I have my iPad next to me so I can do my quick look out online if I have questions. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So uh, yeah, so what what monitors are you are you listening to in the studio and or headphones or both if you're using both? Yeah, uh, I bought the Alesis M1 Active Power speakers when I was setting up my room in Nashville. Um, I kind of like them, but I think the important thing, oh, headphones, I've been using diligently the, uh, what was it, AKG, I think, uh, K240. 240s? Yeah. yeah they're, nice. they're very nice. I think the important thing that, and I tell my students, the important thing is not to lock yourself into one thing, you know, just because you're monitoring your studio does not mean the monitor is the be all and end all of, of gauging how something sounds. You, you take it to your, uh, do people use stereos now? <laughs> I, <don't know>. well, <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> well, <laughs> or you hear it in your car system, your car. sound system, take it everywhere. I have uh, in mix down, you know, speaking of mixing your song, I would play it and I'll run to another room and I'll see what I hear from the other room. I stand with my back facing the monitors because as I was saying, I have hearing deficiency in my right ear. So I stand opposite from the way I would hear it if I were facing the monitor. Gotcha. Uh, take it to your friend's house, use their sound system. Yeah, do it all do it and all. and decide, you know, if everything sounds good. And when I say everything sounds good, in, what's important is if there's a lead instrument. Hold on. Sorry. If there's a lead instrument, that instrument should stand out from the rest, for example, gotcha. and so on and so forth, you know. Yeah. Your rhythm section must be strong and all that kind of stuff. If, uh, if it's a if it's a song with the with with uh, at a reasonably fast tempo, let's say it's a dance piece, uh, your your drums must have an impact. It can't have a soft thud to it. Like your kick must have an impact. You know, so, uh, s several things you want to listen out for when you're mixing down. So um, yeah, so that's my answer to your question. Gotcha. No, thank you. It's, it, it, monitors are a very personal thing for me. Uh, I'm, I use Adam Audio, which uh, Adam Shepard and the crew, they're not far from you there in Nashville. And uh, they're, I'm just a huge fan. I, a monitor needs to tell the truth. And, and um, that's, I struggled for years with different monitors and I've, you know, not, and not to insult any companies, but I mean, I've, I've, I've mixed on countless hours you know, oh, other yeah. studios and, and, you know, some very, very high end. And I, I ran into the Adams. I've got the uh, S3, S3XHs um, in my main setup. I've got the S, or sorry, yeah, I have the A3Xs here with the sub and, uh, and then upstairs, I have A8s or something upstairs. But it, it tells me the truth. So I know when I mix and it sounds good here, 99% of the time when I take it to my car or wherever, it, mm. it sounds good. And uh, and I, I have very little adjusting to do at that point. And I, I think that's the the real catch to a good set of monitors is, is yeah. to get, get you the truth, you know, and, and not color anything and just keep it as neutral as possible. I uh, agree. So that also depends on how you set up your monitors and don't just oh. plonk it wherever you think it should go because uh, the truth is reflected differently. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Well, I have a couple more questions if that's okay. And, yeah. uh, and then we can, we can wrap up uh, if that's all right. Sure. Um, oh, so what do you feel about remote recording? Uh, give uh, me an what do so, you mean by? So in other words, um, I have a studio here and, and you would actually record from your home or your studio and, uh, you know, real time. Uh, have you done that yet? I have not, but I've spoken to a few people who have. A good friend of mine, Neil uh, Merrick Blackwood, he uh, has been doing that with his projects. Um, and it seems that there's several kind of software 
assistance out there that enable you to avoid the lag, the latency yeah. issue? Uh, no, I have not done that, so I'm not sure if you want me to answer that or okay. whether you, you just want oh. an opinion. That's fine. No, that's fine. It, it's uh, you know, it, being that we're in this wonderful 2020 pandemic area uh, era, excuse me. Um, you know, I I wasn't sure if you had done that uh, yet or not, and what you thought of it. Yeah. But uh, if you haven't, we'll I, just. I think the music industry has been quite one of the leading uh, users of you know technology uh, and having to do work remotely. And uh, even if it's not recording in real time, they're quite used to getting uh, a package that, you know, uh, the person doing the project would just package the project, send it across to someone else. They mm -hmm. cannot uh, open the package, so to speak, and record, sort of track. Right. To what they're already. So I think people have been doing this for a long time and are quite accustomed to doing that. And I'm sure they'd rather I don't know, I haven't spoken to anyone, but that could be more preferable to try and do it real time. Unless you need someone to conduct you or something and you play it with other people who are recording simultaneously, which right. could be tricky. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's mm. not fun to do, but it's... Have uh, you done any remote recording yet? I have, yeah. It, it's uh, it it, fine. It, it, it works well. It's just you miss that interaction you know what i mean where you can just glance at somebody and a, and a camera is fine but you don't you don't feel the the same emotional connect yeah. uh, you know instrumentally that that you yeah. do uh, but it's better than nothing you know it's better than saying well i can't record you know and walk um, but and to to the point you just made uh before i i agree i i would much rather work at my leisure and my time my space and that way you know because you're not always uh motivated you know what i mean there are times <laughs> when you hit those you know those lulls blanks like give me my glass of wine you know and and <laughs> and then there's times when you know it could be two in the morning you're like ah, you know and down in the studio so you, you need to be and i don't care what profession it is i don't care if it's well surgeons got a tough time they have to do it <laughs> while they're on the table or not but yeah uh, but I, you know, in IT, I mean, I have that same thing there as well. I'll be sleeping and all of a sudden I'll wake up at four in the morning, you know, with some major project that's going on and I'll be like, ah, I got it. You know, and, yeah. and I have to write it down right there or where yeah. else. So, yeah, you made a good point. The, the personal uh, interaction kind of thing. Yeah, I, I've tried uh, doing improv, you know, like jam, just jamming with this thing called sound jack you know and so you hook up with other people and they try they might manage to somewhat minimize latency uh but it just doesn't quite feel the same as you said you, know, you don't have the people there in front of you i don't know why it's so that it doesn't feel the same but whatever it is that obstacle of yeah. them being behind a glass you know remotely somewhere it just doesn't have the same vibe <laughs> yeah yeah same vibe same impact agreed yeah. Yeah, but, but although again it's better than nothing you know it's it yeah. certainly made the world a smaller place uh, and and allowing us to you know musicians to create with other people that you normally may not have been able to do you know from a financial standpoint if nothing else so true. That's true. like like anything else in technology there's good and bad and, and, yeah true that's, that's very true um that's, so if you had one artist to to your your dream artist to work with who would that be i've always i tell people i don't have any idols and i don't but i do admire one particular artist for her ability to visualize what she wants to hear produce it and do a show production along with it and it's kate bush, kate I, bush. I guess her male equivalent would be taught rundren you know yep. they are the all-consuming do it all person which is what i do you know and i'd like to think our i'm getting near to the level of excellence but i thought you know this is my area of work i've worked as a 
I had a directed a music technology and show design company at one stage. So we do shows for live performances uh, and all, you know, so I kind of, I, so I know the back end and the front end and everything else in between. And I think for the modern musician, it's very important to be able to do that because a situation such as now yep. where, you know, things have to still be done, but the people are not there to assist you and yeah. you can do it. And uh, you're you kind know. of, and you're kind of on your own and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's, that's, it's yeah, so be Kate Bush, I would say. I, that's that. That would be the person I I named. Good, good, good. Of course, there are several others, but you know, she's also a woman. Ha ha ha. I love it. No, that's you know, it, I I remember two years ago when you had asked me, you know, about women in music, and and it, it's it's amazing to me that I think the last 12 to 18 months, I've really seen this huge push, uh, you know, especially in, in younger, you know, ladies that, that are just really coming into their own and, 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 you know, and giving, you know, the musicians of the world and the audiences of the world, both musician or not, uh, you know, a, a new place to, to run to, you know, uh, from a sonic standpoint. And I think that's extremely important that this is, this is the music is is the universal language of the world. I, I've said that forever. Uh, you know, a million other people have said it, or not ten million. Um, but I just think it's so important to to have uh, you know all walks of life, and you know, and and male, female, you know, and, and everybody just putting something into it because you never know where your next favorite artist is, you know, is going to come around the corner. And I just think that's so cool. Mm -hmm. When I last spoke to you, that was really a really good short conversation I had, and I really liked your answers. No, thank you. Because <laughs> I remember talking about women role models, and you said, and it was a very good one. And that's that's. Uh, I think people need to realize. Uh, sorry, I should tell everyone. Your answer was that it doesn't actually have to be a woman; it could be a man as a role model, and that's true. Uh, everyone needs role models. I think that's where we fail sometimes. Yep. Um, we don't give our young, younger generation role models. Not not be that it's our role to give it to them, but you know we should talk about a wide range of people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and 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 not kind of let gender or age or anything get in the way. And it's okay to be, to just call them men or women. I have nothing against that. Uh, right. I think I think a lot of times our young people are uh, kind of uh, guided by cultural persuasion. Uh, meaning, you know, if you're a girl, most your parents will worry that, you know, you will get married and have a family and you know what should you do in the meantime because when you have kids you won't work anymore that kind of thing uh, yeah. or or if you're a man why do you want to be a chef you know you got to provide for your family it, uh, you know the cultural kind of constraints where a lot of people uh you know who insist on pursuing their passion uh, of course, when you insist on pursuing something and you do well at it, other things fall by the wayside. So, you know, sometimes you don't have this, but you have this and it's, it's okay. And that's okay. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just funny how, how life takes us, you know, I'll say the good Lord takes us in, in, in so many directions. And, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, you just, you've got to do for you. And when you do well for you, then you're going to end up by proxy doing well for others, and um, mm -hmm. and I true. and I think it is very important to be a good role model, you know, for whether it's younger generation or somebody older. I mean, everybody's a role model to somebody else in some way, shape, or form, and no matter what it is, you know, uh, cooking folks, you know, might like a certain chef, or you know, mentioned foods. I'm like, well, okay, um, you know, we're we're in the music end. I mean, I've got a, a ton of performers that that I look up to for various reasons. And 
and when their their you know their personal life if you will uh you know sort of lines up with that uh, you know and they're they're good folk not drug addicts you know what i mean and and that's sort of the, when when that all aligns i think that kind of takes it over the top and that's when i really get you know very passionate about that and and uh and i've always tried to be you know a, a good role model to my own kids and uh one's a musician one's not but she loves my daughter loves to listen to music but never had any desire to play my son uh listens and plays uh, you know yeah. but it's uh it, it's just neat you know but yeah. but it is very important i think to be a good role model yeah. you know for for any generation and, uh, so i do have with that said i do have a question for you then how did you get, how did you decide that you really wanted to pursue this area of work where you provide people with a professional system to record the music on and that you can say to them uh, and you can vet your customers with, you know, the vet their needs and wants and say, well, I know what you want, this is it. it, it that That's an incredible question because that, it started out of out of frustration, actually. Um, a, as a musician myself, um, you know, when when tape started going, by, I mean, I recorded on two inch tape for a long time, yeah. and uh, and when you know the digital audio workstation started coming in, as I said, I had been working with Nuendo since version you know one, and yeah. before that, the old Cakewalk, you know, and uh, it was the frustration that every computer that I had used, be it uh, you know, a PC or Mac, um, mm. you know, crashing, locking up in the middle. Uh, mm. If I'm getting paid to do a session, you know, I'll, I'll go to New York or Philly and, and I'll do sessions, you know, in one of the other in the studios. When I have, when I'm getting paid a flat fee, I don't want to sit and wait for somebody else's computer to reboot. <laughs> so that frustration, and I was having similar problems with various brands of machines that I had here in my own studio. And I, I just one day, you know, It'll be six years uh, next month, month after. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking again, asking Chris because I'm like, I don't even know how old I am at this point. Um, <laughs> so that, but that, did you that, brush your teeth? Yeah. yeah. So that was the that was the real frustration, is you know not ha having those crashes and having to deal with that that uh, that nonsense. And I was like, you know, there's got to be a better way. And um, so I did, and uh, I, now I just make music. I don't worry about it. And I wanted to take that experience to the rest of the world. Uh, it, I think the the experience, the vast experience that I've had, both as a as a touring musician, you know, and a, a professional musician, and also an IT goofball, you know, for all these years, I can I at least have something to bring to the table for somebody. And when they say I want to do this, this, and this. I can at least apply my knowledge and say, all right, well, I think, you know, this is, this would work well for you. You know, I mean, nothing's ever, you know, I can't, I can't read somebody's mind or, or hear what they hear, but I can at least get them in the ballpark. And if that gets them started and, you know, on their journey, cool. I did my job. So. Do you, are most of your customers, older people, people already in the business? Are they, you know, young people Mixed. just curious? it's a wide mix we've we've had from teenage customers right up to 75 year old people um and and everything in between so yeah pro, pro musicians to uh to amateurs and and everything in between so now it's 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 pretty amazing uh the demographic that we see is is, is neat it's encouraging it's yeah encouraging. that's excellent that's good to know <laughs> very encouraging good stuff well thank you so so much for yes, spending yeah. uh, an hour you know with me and uh, i know it's hard to believe it's an hour already time flies when you're having fun indeed indeed so it was fantastic speaking with you i hope we can do it again you know yeah. maybe 2021 uh we can do another one or maybe it's summer now if if it happens yeah who knows it was good to see you um